Now, a lot of you in the room um, will have a good idea of who these great people are, um, but for those that might not, can you each give a kind of short, and I do mean short, introduction uh, to yourself and your company? Patrick. So Patrick Comer, I'm the founder and CEO of Lucid. We're probably best known for our Fulcrum Marketplace, uh, which is the programmatic exchange uh, that a majority of, of sample in the US is now using. Uh, this year, about $200 million of sample will be uh, managed by the, the full compliance, both on the buy and sell side. And we see a huge growth in programmatic sampling, programmatic meaning the automated distribution, the buying and selling of sample through systems, through APIs. Yep. I'm Bonnie Breslauer from Lightspeed GMI. Uh, we provide access to uh, audiences through um, our online panels uh, that we manage um, uh, ourselves and also provide access to, to other audiences, so primarily digital data collection. And my role, uh, I wear many, many hats, and uh, one of my key roles is, is to manage some very, very large clients. So in addition to representing the seller side of the equation, I'm, I'm uh, also a, a significant uh, buyer of, of sample. Hi, and I'm Mendy Ormland with uh, Protege, Senior Vice President. Um, we are a global sample provider and data solution, so we all know each other really well on many fronts, and thanks for having us here. No worries. Okay, so as you heard from the intros, the panelists all come from very different areas of the, of the sample industry with differing and often competing models. Um, so let's really use today as an opportunity to get their unique perspectives on the opportunities ahead for the sample industry. Um, so let's get kicked off. Um, Mendy, when we originally talked, um, you were talking about the opportunity that exists, the entrepreneurial spirit that's been that's, that's coming through now. Can you kind of elaborate on a bit more about why you're excited sure. about yeah. Sample right now? So you know, I often, oftentimes go to events and conferences, and typically a lot of the conversation is around pressing issues or problems. Um, and I actually don't see it that way. I think that this industry is in such an amazing time right now. There's so many different opportunities out there um, from new players, new sample providers out there, new technologies that exist, new sources for data collection. I mean, again, there may be issues or problems that could be addressed, but this is, to me, one of the most exciting times this industry has had. And we should embrace it. To me, all these new players are not Disruptive. I think this is expanding the pie. This is giving more opportunity for whoever it is to collect data. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And, and how are you seeing mobile? I mean, mobile's been talked about for so long. Patrick, I know you've got some uh, interesting I, thoughts on this. I congratulate SSI on their previous uh, presentation, and I actually congratulate the entire sample MR space. There's a lot of discussion of mobile and how fast we should move. And within the Fulcrum environment, we've seen. Uh, mobile really become dominant and very, very effective. The amount of work that the sample industry and the market research companies and the data collection companies have done to make the user experience and the data collection process work in app and in browser for mobile is fantastic. For example, in January, we released some data that around 23% of all the respondents that come through Fulcrum, that's about a million a day, um, are coming on device, uh, meaning they're coming through either a tablet or a phone. By April, May, that was 33%. So only in a two or three months time, we've had a 50% increase in the volume of mobile respondents. But probably more importantly than the volume is the conversion rate. Before, uh, back in the day, say 2015, the conversion rate for mobile respondents was half that of a traditional PC or Windows respondent, meaning that they had half the chance of actually completing an interview based upon how the user experience was happening within the actual mobile environment. Now mobile has caught up with traditional surveys as being as good as your traditional PC-based survey. That means that the odds of completing a survey are the same for a respondent on device versus on their laptop or computer. That's a big sea change, because for the longest time we were saying that it was a horrible user experience and the sky was falling and if you don't do anything, it's gonna be terrible. And the super reality is, 
It was we've matched the capability of the traditional online research survey, and we will exceed that from a mobile perspective. In 2016, we'll have the tipping point, and from there on, it'll be easier, faster, and better to take a survey on device versus off. It'll dramatically shift a lot of traditional research methods. Pretty exciting stuff. So finally, Bonnie, where are you on the ever-expanding opportunity that Mendy talks about? Where do you see the big? Yeah, I'm really optimistic, too. And there's a lot of great things happening in the industry. And for those who were at SampleCon, one of the um, items that came up, we, we're all familiar, I think, with the GRIT survey that Lenny puts out. And one of the questions was about the sustainability and viability of online panels. And there, you know, there were definitely a few camps, but there was a lot of concern about whether they would be you know, viable for the long term. We know they take a lot of investment. Uh, we know all too well how much investment is, is really you know, involved. Uh, but from our perspective, they are alive and well, and, and uh, we see lots of application moving forward. And one of the most exciting we've heard about um, today, and that's really about the integration of the attitudinal and the behavioral data, there's lots of applications. So it's not just you know, marrying third-party data sets. And yes, we have a, um, you know, we, we've, we've really done a lot of work um, in that area to provide a, a seamless process. But there's, there's many facets of it. So it's taking some of the, um, the client-specific um, marketing research or syndicated uh, studies and deriving segmentation and doing look-alike modeling and then actually fueling um, the media plans. And so I think you know we're hearing a lot about that. Frank, you talked about it this morning, and Sandra from Clorox talked about it. And you know, moving forward, it's just the perfect application um, for panels. And of course, you've got to be compliant, and it's got to be permission-based. So I don't want to uh, be on social media to uh, <laughs> you know uh, be quoted that you know because that's a, just a, a critical piece, and it's a really good application um, as we move forward. So a lot of enthusiasm. Okay, some great points. So I want to throw a word out to you all and get your perspective um, on what this word means to you personally and the companies that you represent here today. And um, that word's disruption. So Patrick, do you want to kick us off? Well, we've been called disruptive. Yeah, I'm, I, I have that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, adding a marketplace to an industry without a marketplace is disruptive by its nature. Um, and I think now what's being disruptive in the sample and research space is the speed and scale of data. So historically, we would look at data sizes in the you know, 150 interviews to 1,500 interviews, and that was considered a lot. Um, now we're looking at adding one to two zeros, clients that want to do 10,000, 100,000 interviews. We had a client run 500,000 four-question interviews in 10 days. That's the kind of data scale we're looking at. And so speed is also becoming important. We used to look at interviews happening over a week. Now we're talking about even a day and even minutes in terms of how fast. And so we look at disruption happening in speed and in scale. And a lot of companies do one or the other well, or at least trying to. And those companies that can do both speed and scale effectively are going to be the most disruptive as we move forward. I, I love the word disruptive, and some of you may have heard me say that um, before. But we, you know, you hear it um, just across across all industries. Um, that word destruction, uh, destruction, <laughs> disruption has such a negative. Isn't it the same thing? <laughs> it has such a negative, you know, connotation, and really, it's what you know propels us forward. And if you think about, you know, the brokerage business, Charles Schwab was so disruptive back in their day. But that doesn't mean that full service brokerage firms, you know, went out of business. They're they're still around. So there's, lot, there's lots of room, and um, from my perspective, I think one of the things, I agree with the, you know, the automation um, and the speed, and I think we have to get there. Um, one of the other areas that could be considered disruptive is just the erosion of some of the market research revenue uh, that's traditionally you know, generated by marketing research companies. So when we look at the integration, again, the integration of data, um, we're looking at, you know, it's not just our primary research, but it's also taking a look at you know, syndicated research that already exists, the social media um, uh, data, you know, all of the analytics. Uh, there's lots of you know, big data out there. And to be able to incorporate all of that data so that we can, at the end of the day, you know, ask short, you know, field shorter surveys and make them more engaging, 
um, I, I, th I think that that's a very positive outcome of, of where we will, you know, go into the in the future. So there's there's I, I'm I love it. Yeah, and for me, I mean, like I said before, disruptive. Obviously, things could be disruptive or destructive, right? But um, <laughs> don't quote me. On that. <laughs> I mean, I use the word typically when I see disruption in in, in a in a business. Um, oftentimes, it's opportunity. The pie is expanding. There's a new method. Um, one could look at it and say, no, because we've been doing this for a long time. Which, you know, there is some truth to some of that, or it, or it might be entirely true, but. There also could be a new method, right? If, if we would have said, you know, think about just a, a silly example, but telephone to mobile phone, right? It's like, imagine we said no, telephones, what, what is this mobile device? And any time, it's really entrepreneurship at its, at its core. It's creating something new. That thing that may be new, that new method may not fit your needs or that project or whatever you may be looking to conduct. But to me, it's opportunity and expanding the pie for opportunity as well. Definitely. Definitely. So it seems to me um, that a lot of the expanding opportunity we're seeing is down to that innovation in technology and the adoption of technology. Um, as someone who came into this industry only three years ago from a tech startup background rather than a research background, um, my personal kind of perspective is that the industry initially can be very slow to adopt new technology from a technology perspective, from kind of embracing it. It's often assumed that the starting point is, is this won't work or seven reasons why it won't work or the clients aren't asking for it yet. Um, Patrick, as a kind of veteran of the industry who moved away from the more traditional model to the programmatic exchange right on the kind of bleeding edge of what we're seeing becoming more mainstream now, what's your, what's your perspective? Well, I've seen time and time again the industry not adopt new models, especially around sampling. And we look back to telephone to online, the amount of angst that even some associations are still going through about this transition. Uh, really, there was a lot of what I call FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that was spread about the viability and acceptability of online surveys. Uh, we saw the same thing when, uh, dare I say, river and routing, without it being a dirty word, when that became more prevalent, uh, there was a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and a lot of companies spent a lot of time saying that was an unacceptable method. Now we see this, some of the same thing happening with uh, programmatic or other new methods of sampling or automation. And I, I challenge the industry to start looking with an entrepreneurial mindset at new technologies. A lot of what happens at this uh, conference is about looking at adopting and acknowledging where technology is actually going and saying that might actually be the right answer versus a more of a more fearful approach. But I look at the unintended consequences of my own activity, uh, programmatic exchanges while driving a lot of automation and driving a lot of uh, speed um, has been adopted widely and suddenly there's a lot more transactions, there are a lot more companies who buy and sell sample at speed and, and dare I say at scale. One of the unintended consequences is that everyone's buying from everyone else. There used to be this concept there were silos or panels of purity. There was one company, another company, and their uh, respondents were separate. Uh, now the amount of overlap between uh, purchasing is so strong it's hard to differentiate just on what I call brand. There's so much overlap, and that's one of the big, big challenges is how do you manage consistency of a sample flow when there's so much automation and so much buying in the background. So it's one of the unintended consequences of technology is what's the uh, potential negative outcome. So would you say all panels are equal? Because uh, that is such... absolutely not true. There's been so much work done. I mean, how many times have we seen the slide panel A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and I, which was YouGov, by the way, um, on a slide that says they're different, right? Yeah. But the overlap, let's say that somewhere between 20 and 40% of their supply chain is the same. So there are differences, but there are also more and more similarities between the two. And that has unintended consequences in how you manage, say, trackers. Bonnie, thoughts on So of Rita? course I disagree. Nah. <laughs> I did not see that coming. We wanted to, you know, provide some entertainment for y'all. Um, but I think You're that, always entertaining. <laughs> uh, I think that it, you know, 
it depends on the, you know, for us, we have traditional online panels. So we're still managing them in a, in a, in a way where we, you know, we know where our sample is coming from. We, um, we're not bringing in to our, our panel a lot of, you know, sources um, that, are, that are being shared, um, you know, across, you know, you know, sure, there's some duplication, um, but we're still very deliberate about our, our recruiting practices. So um, we know that, that panels behave differently and that every source you know, there are nuances to every single source. So we, you know, the, the blending protocol is really, really important, and I think it has to be, um, you know, planned for because at the end of the day, you know, when, when data comes back and there's a, a change, you've got to be able to identify if that change is because of the sample. It's the first question we get. Did something change in the sample, or is it actually because the market changed, or a competitor came in, or it's you know there's something in the category, and we're, you know their external benchmarks are used, and, and and clients are very very savvy, so we we ha we are um, you know very uh, I think you know cognizant and, and very diligent in, in terms of that blending. And sure, there may be a portion of the sample that can come in. Um, you know, we, 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 we get carried away at light speed, but um, as I think the people up here know. Um, but sure, there could be, you know, a portion that comes in, you know, from, from sources that are programmatic. Uh, but again, we're not, we're, we're still, you know, looking at those um, online panels as, as really being uh, a way to, to maintain some of the consistency. So, so Mindy. Yeah, I'm confused a little bit. Um, you look confused. <laughs> yeah, so I'm trying to understand this, in your views, does programmatic mean you can't manage panels and consistency and blends? Like, I don't see why that gets in the way necessarily. I, it, mm -hmm. I could see why you may th think it's more difficult, but programmatic and, and automation is just making that, maybe the scale, it's, the speed is there, but you can do the same exact things. How is that not a concern when you're purchasing via manual efforts? Well, there, I think it comes down to the sample design. So, we, you know, you could have um, a study and it's just age and, you know, you balance on age and gender and maybe region. Um, and you know you need to consider the requirements for an individual study. For so for some studies that may be fine, um, but if you're looking if you're doing a financial services study, for example, it's building out that sample design to include um, and make sure you're balancing, for example, on investable assets or income, or if it's a consumption study, taking into consideration you know household size. So I think the the um, we just don't want to lose that um, that that sample. Design design element. And so yes, I think, I think there is confusion between sourcing and programmatic, um, and the two do, do come together you know, in, in some cases. But again, it's going back to that core, um, you know, that core sample management piece. Okay. What do you, what do you think, Patrick? I just think it gets easy to broker sample. It's got, since I got in the industry, it's gotten easier and easier to, to broker sample, meaning you buy, you guarantee a certain amount of supply or a certain number of uh, respondents to a given study, and then the survey starts and you actually buy it from a third party. And so that's gotten really simple and fast to do. And the concept that you can manage supply based upon whom it's coming from gets more challenging because you can't always see what's happening in the background. And that's where transparency of source becomes more and more important. I agree with that. So I just think that consistency gets hard because it's so easy and it can happen so quickly. And of course, I'm kind of pitching against myself because we provide that capability, right? But that's one of the unintended consequences of speed and, and technology is now we have to get good at managing consistency and fraud and quality at a programmatic scale, which is a very different set of, of, of tools than when you're doing it manually um, in a traditional method. Yeah, but I, I still think, I'm sorry I'm harping on this, and I, I totally keep going, keep going. It's good. I totally see that point, but I still think as a, you know, the transparency that you're referring to about the sample source, um, that same transparency is needed on, from the buy side on the sample frame, meaning the sample source could be consistent. There's consistent right. Absolutely. measures you can take. There's things you can, you know, via automation, there's a lot of things um, and we do a lot of that, so I'm familiar with the different methods. So I don't think necessarily the consistency or is, is the issue. If, if the sample provider understands the needs that you're referring to, that could all be done still through 
maybe not 100% programmatic, but maybe 70%, maybe the delivery of it is through automation with the, an email exchange about the sample frame and the client needs. So I don't think it's necessarily an all or nothing, and oftentimes it feels like just because there's that one potential issue, it means the whole thing goes to the garbage. Okay, so I think we agree that rigor is important. There are mixed opinions on consistency, which is great to hear. Um, one of the big topics that also came up at SampleCon, and it's come up just in that discussion there, is this term quality. Mm -hmm. And quality obviously means so many different things. And I always like to think of the kind of that classic equation. You can have quality, you can have speed, and you've got cost. And typically, you can only have two of the three. Um, do, do we get three? Is it possible to get all three? It's what everybody wants. It's what we've heard all day. <laughs> and just to caveat right. that, I mean, we're looking at the GRIP report. 38% um, of buyers and sellers think quality will get worse. Well, I stared down all that GRIP data for hours. And I was fascinated with the difference between sample buyers and sample sellers and their view on where sample quality was going. One of the most compelling things is that sample buyers were looking at sample quality going down. And one of the main reasons for the, uh, the disparagement was technology was causing this problem. What was more interesting is suppliers were saying quality is improving and technology was the reason why quality was improving. So we've got this challenge where the perception is very different. And one of the other key things I found confusing but interesting is the size of company had a huge um, indication on your impression of quality. If, if you're a smaller agency, less than 100 employees, whether or not you think that's small or not, but less than 100, uh, there was a, this concept that quality was going down and that you had to directly supervise all of the sampling efforts from the frame and the delivery. Whereas larger companies, 100 plus, were thought quality was fine and were giving more and more control and more and more uh, ability to the supplier to make their own choices. And so we have this uh, shifting sand of, A, what is quality, where is it going, and how does technology either improve or make quality more challenging. Um, it's an ongoing topic, I must say. And there's lots of facets to, to quality. So there's the, you know, obviously there's a lot of tools. Um, you know, that have been developed to help us with, you know, the, the basic hygiene it's considered now. We had, back in 2008, we had Chinese uh, people in China taking st surveys in the U.S. on our My Survey panel. And so we had to jump into high gear. And um, now there's lots of tools available that, you know, are technology enabled to help us with the identity validation and making sure people are in the right country, you know, and, and all of that. And we need to keep upping our game um, because, you know, there are people out there that are going to try to, um, you know, game the system and, and try to make money on our, on our surveys. Um, but I think there's some other um, aspects to it. And so people are very quick to say, oh my gosh, you know, there's something wrong with the data. You know, you've got fraudsters. And then we'll go in and we'll take a look at, you know, where people are, are screening out and where they're, you know, um, there, there might be a trap question and, you know, there's a lot of confusion. And we find that it's it's really the survey instrument that can drive um, you know the the issues with you know the data and, and not all the time. I mean certainly there's going to be instances where you know we 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 see people are gaming. We've got to make sure we're on top of that. But it's all you know if you've got a survey um, that's really long that doesn't screen for the right requirements, um, you're going to have people coming in that aren't going to know your category, and they you know yeah they might not give um, you know the right um, you know, the right answers. So again, I, I, I envy you because we don't have all those mobile friendly surveys on our panel. <laughs> we have, you know, I think there's a lot of headway, um, but we still see, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, survey instruments that um, are either, you know, um, have been around for a long time or they're, they're using respondent design, but they're still not, um, you know, where they need to be in terms of, of um, really being engaging and, and, and short enough for the, yeah. for the respondent. And every, every time I hear the, this quality thing, it's like, you so broadly, like, what is qu quality? What, what does that even mean, the quality is no good? Is it the fraudster? Is it, spe is it incorrect answers? Or I shouldn't say incorrect, but, but responses that make no sense? Um, you know, if we look back a little bit to the advertising world, right? I mean, think about what would have happened if 
the adverti advertising world stayed in the newspaper and didn't come online because they're too concerned about quality. You think that doesn't exist, fraudster? So there's huge anti-fraud solutions out there. There's multiple of them. Each technology leads to the next, right? But if we're too afraid to move forward because of the potential fraudster, we're never gonna move forward. And, and there's a lot of solutions, I think, within this industry in particular uh, that folks use, whether through automation or they have certain ways of detecting the, the honesty, honesty, the uh, authenticity Thanks of the responses. The yeah, the, the honesty, honesty detector. Detect, honesty <laughs> detection. But, you know, I think the one thing, you know, coming from the, as a panel provider, coming from that world and investing a lot in member acquisition, user acquisition budget to continue building panel. I continuously think what gets lost in the mix is we keep thinking about whether the data was good or not. Um, I think the issue, or a, one of the key issues there, is think about the brand that is investing money to conduct research. As long as you're looking for self-reported data from consumers, doesn't the brand want to talk to the consumer? Or is somebody else deciding how the brand may want to talk to that consumer? So a 40-minute study may not be the way that brand should be connecting with the consumer. And as long as we have this separation between the survey instrument, the survey design, but the consumer that you're looking, you're looking for data from that person, but somehow we often forget that that's a real person. We call them a, just a, you know, a panelist or a robot or they, I don't know what words people use out there. It's just think about it. It's a real person answering the survey. And when you put together the survey for the client um, or if the client's putting it together, think about that person. Where, where do you think they're going to interact with your survey? Probably there's a very good chance that mobile is a good starting point. Many of us, I barely see any computers in this room at this point, desktops, right? Everybody is interacting from their email, from their mobile phone. So um, I don't know if I just went on a rant over there, but I, I shouldn't. And uh, go Warriors. Go yeah. Warriors. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I think um, that respondent experience is often missed in that quality discussion. So I think any more we can do. I, mean, I think it's dramatically improving. That's the thing, yeah. that's the message I want to say. We, we can talk about I'll mobile turns blue in the face, but the data clearly shows that the respondent experience and survey taking has improved dramatically in the past 12 months. There's a lot more to do, but I, I, I cannot say that enough. The, all the, the raging we've done over five to 10 years about the mobile sky is falling, we've actually done something as an industry to, to do that, um, and kudos. Well done, I would say. Well yes. done. Yeah, well done. Well done, sample people. Yeah. OK, so what I'm kind of interested in now is, and Bonnie, I know you've been thinking about this one a lot. Uh -oh. <laughs> Everyone so at my company asked me, you know, what's the vision, what's the future? Yeah, so <laughs> what we want to know is, what's your vision of sample? And we're talking medium term. So let's say five years out. So five years from now, What's different? What's changed? What's big? What's disappeared? Has anything? Yeah, I mean, I think I've touched on some, some of it. So I think it's the integration of, of sources, um, you know, where research will always play a role. And we, you know, we, we definitely want the attitudes. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, having not just the, um, the why, but the, the buy. So it's the buy, you know, behind the why. Uh, so I, I think it is, you know, tapping into all the sources and, and putting them together. Um, and I think that the, you know, where we'll go in the future will definitely, t technology and automation will, will guide us. There's a lot of, of, um, of movement in that digital space. And so I think, you know, we were just talking about it earlier. There's going to be, when we were planning, you know, for SampleCon, we, we think there's, you know, I think we all agree that, that moving forward, um, the way that, that marketing research will be used, um, you know, will really take us to new places, um, and you know, beyond just the traditional marketing research applications, like like media plans and and uh, digital targeting, advertising targeting. Yeah, and I think I think we're living in the future right now. I think this is part of the future. Where it's going to be in five years, I wish I had the answer. I answers. think we need five years to get there. I don't think it's necessary either. <laughs> I think right now we are living in the future and. 
there's so many great things happening. Um, you know, I would just add in, Dave, on your workshop with video. I mean, it's impressive what could be done. You know, you know, we mentioned before mobile, video, Bonnie, some of the sources that you spoke about. It's just such an exciting time. We're living in the future. I'm excited. I, if I get one bit on this, I would say we're actually moving at a faster pace now in development than ad tech is. So when we started introducing programmatic concepts about three years ago, we looked at the crystal ball that was ad tech. How are they using exchanges and DSPs and DMPs and attribution look like models? All those were phrases that were not used in sampling or research. Past three years, sample industries adopted all those phrases because they actually correlate very highly. And with some of the key challenges that are facing the ad space, we're now actually solving from a research perspective. And so we already know that ad tech and martech are starting to converge. Yeah. And I hate using this term, but sample tech uh, <laughs> is actually converging with those three areas. A lot of the platforms that are big in ad tech, whether that's an exchange like Zaxxis, for example, um, or even a DMP like Oracle, these are all parts and in infrastructure that we will start using as research companies, whether we're sampling or otherwise. The big Wild West, for better or worse, is data. I think that sample is going to look more and more like data over time <clears throat> than respondent engagement. The more, there's more data that's already known about all the respondents than you could possibly ask in a survey. And so it's not about which questions you're going to ask, but also what's already known about a respondent, yeah. and not just from the data you have, but the data we all already have about respondents. And that, then, of course, you have to layer on top of that the privacy and security debate raging both here and in Europe. So this is going to be a moving, exciting target. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, data is the name of the game, and I'm excited about that. Excellent point. So just before we, uh, we wrap this up, I'd like to kind of open out any questions to the audience and uh, anything, you, any deep burning question you've got to uh, ask our panelists here today. It is the afternoon of day two, so just we covered it. There we go, Frank. <laughs> uh, just a quick question on, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned automation, of course, and uh, looking ahead a few years, what is the role of the marketing researchers if uh, field work can be easily automated? Um, where many, right now, much, much of the samples is sold to the marketing researchers. Tell the story. It's the insights, it's what it means. Right? Sample can't provide why or just how it got there. So I think that the amount of data available and the ease of access will only improve. So when Mindy talks about increasing the pie, we're seeing more and more companies that are purchasing sample or data or insights that don't even know they're in the research industry, but they are providing insights, visualization, analysis. And so that's only going to expand. Because uh, you mentioned earlier maybe uh, flatlining of large MR companies, but the number of technology companies that are not only here, but are also outside of these walls that are doing analysis on the fly, are only expanding the pie, and those are the exciting opportunities for growth that I see. But even, even though many firms are you know, adopting new methods as well, a lot of these full service firms, I mean, I remember when you know, the DIY, when first DIY first came out, and there was, the adoption d didn't take off immediately, right? It was, it was a slow, it, it didn't happen very quickly, and people sat with this DIY that they invested in that technology for a long time and didn't really go many places. But today, I mean, look how many companies have adopted that method. So whether um, it was timing or you know maybe the timing just wasn't right or it just took time to really learn how to use it. But you know, I think many firms are kind of looking at the different methods they have and kind of adopting towards the needs. But I completely agree that it's going to look more like it's data and insights versus thinking about a, you know, just a survey or self-reported. Definitely. Any other questions out there? I got one in the back. Hi, so I'm Hi, Dino. Hi. <laughs> so you talked a lot about mobile and the increase in mobile traffic. And so I'm curious what each one of you is doing at your businesses to prepare for that today and in the future. Is that only continues to increase. Yeah, I can take that. <clears throat> While I can't share everything we're doing on mobile. <laughs> like, wait a minute, what am I supposed to talk about? It's a trap. Mm, it's a trap. Um, I can't share everything we're doing on mobile, but what I could say from a product and tech pipeline, when we think about what we're building and what we're investing in, 
there is no product that can get through that is just thought of as a desktop solution. Everything has to be mobile. If, if it doesn't have mobile or it's not, whether it's mobile optimized or usable, mobile friendly, I don't know what term we want to use, we will not invest in just a desktop solution in terms of future builds. Everything has to have a mobile component. I know it doesn't answer what we're doing in terms of sampling and data collection. I mean, obviously we're doing all the, you know, the geofencing and in the moment, all that kind of stuff, but I think it's just important, the point of, you have to think mobile or you're miss, I think we're missing the boat if we don't. Yeah, agree. I mean, it's all about being mobile first and whether it's, you know, having surveys that people come in, you know, on any device, uh, whether it be their smartphone or their tablet or their, you know, their PC, being able to have that good experience or being able to access a survey through an app. So definitely, you know, a combination of, um, you know, being able to take surveys, um, you know, through our, through the, you know, the traditional means, but also through the apps and then building out the apps so that they're, you know, um, I, I think really, you know, more than just uh, taking that, that survey experience, but there's lots of, you know, facets to it in terms of, and I know you guys are into the engagement piece, so really important. So we split mobile between web view or browser, which we think has basically been solved, um, versus in-app, or I'm going to say future device. We could talk about VR, we could talk about uh, set-top boxes. There's a lot of methods for user engagement for media and content that are not the mobile in-app experience. And so our big push is how do you build the right sample engagement marketplace around future proofing, not just current proofing for the in-app experience and future app experience. So that's sort of our thought process going into is how do we actually prepare for what's coming, not what, not where we already are. Mm. Um, I, I think it's not only imminently solvable, but also pretty awesome. Excellent. So if there's, is there any more questions before we wrap up? Um, no. No, so I'd like to thank uh, the panelists here today for doing such a great job. Um, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I have the easy bit. Ah. <laughs>